We've been doing conventicles every year, apart from 2020, every year since 2003. We had one in 2000, year 2000 as well. Sadly, I think this will be my last one with the retiring at the end of July, but oh. realised that one we'd never actually had was in Carsfairn Churchyard. Often we would go out into the wilder places, but realised we needed to catch up a little bit in having them around the churchyards. And there are two covenanters. Well, one stone we have here for, for Roger Dunn. I'll pitch you here a little bit more later. And this Gilbert McAdam, who was a covenanter from Carsfairn Parish, he, some stories say he was killed he, when, he, when he was killed at Kirk Michael in Ayrshire. He was buried up there. Other stories say he was buried here. Or whether what exactly happened? Whether his body was moved back to the family layer, I'm not quite sure. But so there's two stories there. But after the end of the service, anyone who wishes, I'll take you around to show you where the Kirk Michael mausoleum is, where where it's believed that uh, that Gilbert McAdam was was buried. But come in. We've got a spare one for anyone. We've got a spare one for anyone. Keep going. Keep going there. Then we can share. Good. Shall we begin our service with the singing of our first hymn, I to the Hills Will Lift My Name. Right. If you're able, you'd like to stand to sing. I to the hills will lift my eyes from whence doth come my name. My safety cometh from the Lord, who heaven and earth hath made. Thy fruit he'll not let slide, nor will he slumber. Almighty God, maker of earth and heaven, we come before you as your people in the midst of the beauties of your creation. We do not meet today in our church buildings made by our hands and dedicated to your glory, but we stand out in the open air that we may see in fresh and different ways your glory in the midst of your creation. Your hands are the depths of the earth, the strength of the hills is yours. And yet also each tiny flower sings your praises. You're not only a great and mighty God, but a loving God who is interested in every little detail of our lives. We're thankful that for most of us our live lines have fallen in pleasant places compared to the sufferings of the covenanters that they had to endure. Yet we confess that too often there is a softness about our lives. Our lives are riddled with compromise and we live too self-sufficiently. We fail to remember that our lives are dependent on you. You give us life and breath. And in the end our eternity rests in your hands. Help us to recognise you in the daily fabric of our lives. To live lives open to you. 
forgive us our half-heartedness and give us a fresh vision of your love for us, your purposes for our lives, that we might learn to live in daily dependence on you. Help us to see how in Jesus Christ you have drawn close to us and that the same love of Christ that won the covenanters of 300 years ago to such rugged faith and commitment to you is extended to us in our own time. Today in this place, beneath the overarching heavens and the encircling hills, we entrust our, our lives to your care once more. Carsvain Parish only came into existence by an act of the Scottish Parliament in 1645. Prior to that, people of the surrounding area had got together and built a church at their own expense in 1635 to 36. And so there was an energy and commitment from the people to support and build their new church community. When Charles I tried to introduce the Episcopalian form of worship in 1638, no doubt there was a, lo a strong local support for the National Covenant that was signed all around Scotland in 1638. Then entered the scene an inspiring, charismatic figure. John Semple had gone over to Ulster to support the Scottish ministers who had gone over there to help establish Presbyterian worship amongst the Scotch emigrants, Scots emigrants of the Ulster plantation. And he had bit of, made a bit of a name for himself as a field preacher in the times of revival that spread through the community there at that time. St Paul came back to Kukubri and offered himself for the ministry of the Church of Scotland. He was a fairly humble background and didn't have the knowledge of the Latin language that was normally required of ministers. But the Presbytery of Kirkubri recognised his God-given gifts for communicating the Christian message and thought, what better person could there be to build up and strengthen the new church amongst the wild hill folk of Carsphere? Their choice was an, an inspired one. And John Semple threw himself into the challenge of building up Christ's church in this new parish and discipling the local folk. He was appointed as the first parish minister in 1636. He quickly made a name for himself throughout the area and became one of the leaders of the Covenanting movement. His communion seasons gathered people from far and wide. And at these communion gatherings, where many other local ministers would also preach, in Carsphairn, Semple was above all the man people came to hear. He was renowned as an inspirational spiritual figure and a man of the people. He inspired a religion of the heart, building a deep commitment of the local people to their Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Inevitably, Semple's presence put Carsphairn at the heart of the covenanting struggle when times of persecution came in 1662 under Charles II. And Semple, like all the other local ministers, was evicted from his pulpit. He was allowed to return to his own pulpit in 1672. He, he considered his first calling was to be there as shepherd of his sheep in Carsphere Parish in the midst of their times of trial and persecution but he was still unapologetically his own person and at times ran into conflict with the authorities. He died in Karsvein in 1677 at the age of 75 and is buried here in this churchyard. We're not quite sure where. There's no stone, at least we can read, that mentions, has his name on it, but he is buried here somewhere in this churchyard, most likely around the other side where ministers seem to have been buried especially. The government authorities recognised that they had to come down heavily on Carsphere as a hotbed of covenanting sympathies if they were going to establish the new church. One brave curate, bachelor Peter Pearson, 
volunteered to come and take on that challenge. He became friendly with the arch persecutor of the Covenanters, Robert Grierson of Lag, who would often base himself at the nearby farm of Garryhorn with a military garrison, Garryhorn, just up in the hills towards the lead mines over there. There was also, for a time, another military garrison stationed here in Carsfairn village itself. Not surprisingly, very few people attended Pearson's services in the church. And in 1684, Pearson produced a list of nearly all his parishioners, naming them disorderly for not attending church. In December, 17, in December 1684, things came to a head when a small delegation of the Covenanters went to the manse to ask him to desist from his persecution of his own parishioners. And in an ensuing scuffle, he was shot dead. James McMichael was judged the guilty party, and he had a reputation for being a bit of a hothead. He claimed the shooting was an accident, though he was to lose his own life a few days later on Ochenkloy Moor, near Uganda. We sing now our next song. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and our strength. refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Rescue me and deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge to which I can always go. Give the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O my God, from ha the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of evil and cruel men. For you have been my hope, O Sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. From my birth I have relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will ever praise you. I have become like a portent to many, but you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise, declaring your splendour all day long. Do not, do not cast me away when I am old. Do not forsake me when my strength is gone. For my enemies speak against me. Those who wait to kill me conspire together. They say, God has forsaken him. Pursue him and seize him, for no one will rescue him. But not far from me, O God. Be not far from me, O God. 
Come quickly, O oh my God, to help me. May my accusers perish in shame. May those who want to harm me be covered with scorn and disgrace. But as for me, I shall always have hope. I will praise you more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteousness, of your salvation all day long. Oh, I know not its measure. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, O Sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteousness, yours alone. Since my youth, O God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvellous deeds. Even when I am old and grey, do not forsake me until I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. Quite a few motorbikes in our, our recording <laughs> video. <laughs> Thanks, Scott, for doing that for us. Our next <clears throat> psalm number 42 As Pants the Heart for Flowing Streams. <clears throat> associated with Carsvain Parish and we discover wrongs done by both sides in the conflict during these turbulent times. The first man we meet is Roger Dunn. The stone here reads, erected in memory of Roger Dunn, who was born in Ben Hot in the parish of Dalmellington, 1659. He suffered, much, he suffered much from persecution for the cause of Christ and was killed on the night of Carsfairn Fair, June 1689, on the farm of Brockloch. A poetic epitaph with pagan references follows thus. Plucked from Minerva's breast, here am I laid, where debt to cruel Atropos I've paid, resting from my clay fabric in the dust, Amongst, among the holy ashes of the just, my soul set sail for the celestial shore till the last trump the same with joy restore. Also, Robert Dunn of Gary Horn died October the 6th, 1738. Simpson, in his book Traditions of the Covenanters, has the following. A few notices may here be given of Roger Dunn, a noted covenanter who lived in the higher parts of Ayrshire. Roger Dunn was born in 1659. His father, James Dunn, a worthy man, was farmer of Ben Watt in the parish of Dalmellington and was with others exposed to no small trouble in those trying times. Roger, when he grew up, 
and was able to judge for himself, resolved to share the fortunes of the Covenanters. It was soon known that Roger Dunn had allied himself to the obnoxious party and therefore his ruin was determined on. A conventicle had been held at Craig New in Carsfairn, possibly actually at Craig Naw, south of Loch Trool, and actually in Marnie Gaff Parish, Marnie Gaff Parish. And Roger, with two of his brothers, attended the meeting. The report of this circumstance soon spread, and the, the dragoons were sent to apprehend all they could find returning from this place. They met the three brothers on the way home. Andrew and Alan were made prisoners and carried back to Carsfairn, but what befell them is not known, for they were never more heard of. Other writers suggest that the names of his two brothers were actually James and Robert Dunn, who we meet later in the story. Roger, however, by a sudden and unexpected spring, eluded the grasp of the soldier who attempted to seize him, and bounding away, fled to a soft, marshy place into which the horseman durst not venture and made his escape. After this, Dunn sought a, ret a retreat in Donaskin Glen, a place about two miles from Ben Watt. One morning, as he was returning home from his hiding place, he encountered unexpectedly a party of dragoons who were sent to search for him. He was so near them that to attempt flight was in vain. In order, therefore, to avoid suspicion, he appeared to be as much at, as, at ease as possible. And walking forward with an undaunted mien, he determined to accost the soldiers in a style that would tend to direct their attention away from himself. I think I can guess your errand, gentlemen, addressing the troopers in a familiar manner. I am thinking you are in search of Roger Dunn, who is supposed to be in concealment somewhere in this quarter. It is even so, replied the commander of the, of the party. He is the very person we are in quest of. Well, said Roger, though I hate the name of an informer, yet I think I could direct you to a place in which he is sometimes to be found. See you yon shepherd's hut afar in the waste? Bear down directly upon it and see what you can find. You're an honest fellow, I opine, answered the leader, and we will follow your advice. The party then proceeded onward at full speed, and Roger, with all expedition, betook himself to his hiding place in the glen, which is said to have been beneath the projecting bank of a mountain stream. In this seclusion, where the hallowed voice of prayer often mingled with a soft murmuring of a silvery brook, he found a place of safety from man and of communion with his God. On another occasion, when Roger had crept from his concealment and found his way unperceived to his father's house, he was surprised by the hasty arrival of a company of troopers before the door. He attempted to escape through an aperture in the gable of the house, but it being partly closed up with rubbish, he was hindered from making his way with the speed that was desirable. When the soldiers entered, Roger was gone, but they found a youth of 16 years of age, most probably his younger brother, Quintin, who was banished to the Jamaican plantations in the summer of 1685, who had not time to follow his friend. When him they seized, and how he was disposed of, none could tell, for he was never again seen in the country. Dunn made his way through a morass, leaving his pursuers behind him and got with all safety into his retreat in Glen Askin. From the incessant harassings to which he was subjected, Roger Dunn found it necessary to leave the district and to retire to the lower parts of Galloway. When he was in the neighbourhood of Minigaff, residing in the house of a friend who was favourable to the cause in which he suffered hardship, he nearly lost his life by the hand of the enemy. The soldiers Having made an attack on the house in which he was lodged, two of its inmates were killed, defending themselves. And Dunn, after an ineffectual resistance, fled. And plunging into the waters of a nearby neighbouring loch, swam underwater to a shallow place in the middle, 
where grew several shrubs and willows, at the side of which he emerged while the soldiers shot into the lake at random. Owing to this immersion in the cold waters, he got a severe fever which threatened to terminate his life, but from which he ultimately recovered. Thompson, in his 1875 book, Martyr Graves, gives a slightly different version. The tradition is that it was on a Sabbath morning, and when they were engaged in prayer and in reading the scriptures, that the dragoons surprised the six martyrs. The seventh, a Dunn, the brother of the two Duns that were shot, James and Robert, managed to escape from the house and was closely followed by two of the soldiers. Seeing no other way of safety, he made for Loch Troll. For a moment, a little hill concealed him from view of his pursuers as he ran into the water. Once in the loch, he got in among the reeds, where although his head was above water, he was entirely out of sight. The soldiers fired at random, but no shot came near him. How long he remained standing up to his neck in water is not recorded, but he remained so long, and the time was the month of January, that he shivered with cold and caught fever. When he came out, he took refuge in a house close to the loch. Sent him to bed with his, while his clothes were drying. The fever soon appeared and raged with great violence until his life was despaired of. A young woman in the house carefully nursed him during his illness. At last he recovered, and the story pleasantly ends by saying that after a time, John <coughs> married his nurse. This almost certainly looks like an account of the incident at. Holdens near Loch Trull in January 1685, in which Captain Alexander Urquhart of His Majesty's Regiment of Foot Guards and a number of Covenanters were killed. It would seem that most of the Covenanters killed at Caldens had taken to hiding deep in the hills along the Garrick-Galloway border in the winter of 1684 to 1685, in the midst of the killing times and that the Dunn brothers had abandoned the area around their homes near Dalmellington to seek refuge in the remote hill houses at Star, just south of Loch Doon. At some point, probably not long before the attack, they had moved further south into Galloway. When Captain James Douglas arrived in Galloway with 200 soldiers in January 1685, he planted three new garrisons at Machermore Castle, Earlston Castle and at Waterhead in Carswearn Parish. The latter was not that far really from Star and was the home of Macadam of Waterhead. This would have put more pressure on the Dunn family as Roger's sister was married to the Covenanter Gilbert Macadam, Waterhead's son. Though the writers on the Covenanters give the impression that it was an innocent gathering of Covenanters for worship that was attacked by Colonel Douglas and his troops. It could be that the Covenanters set out to attack the troops, which they saw as a serious threat. And it was in this engagement that Captain Urquhart was killed. Roger lived till after the revolution of 1688 and was at last killed at Woodhead in Carsvain Parish after the end of the Troubles by an ind individual who mistook him for another person whom he intended to murder, so that the worthy man who had so often escaped the sword of the public prosecutor, of the public persecutor, fell by the hand of a private assassin. It is possible that he was living at Garryhorn at that time. Most probably it was his son Robert who died at Garryhorn in 1738, and who is also named on his stone. Robert was living in Gary Horn in 1736. We know that from a census that took place in Carsvain Parish at that time. We also know that there was another Robert Dunn who was at Carsvain Church Elder living at Woodhead in 1736. Now to turn to the other Covenanters associated with Carsvain that we remember today. During the reign of King Charles II, the Macadams were ardent Covenanters. Gilbert Macadam, the younger, younger of Waterhead, early 
made his name for himself as a bit of a hothead. He was hauled before the Privy Council in Edinburgh in 1671, accused of being the ringleader in beating up the former jurist of Carsfair, David McCurry, when he came back to claim some unpaid stipend. He was fined for this incident. Though there was clearly another side to this incident, for at the same time a case was brought by Gilbert McCormick of Carnaval and John Macmillan of Drumness. The, the same day, David McQuern, along with others, had come to the house of David McCormick with swords and pistols, broken down his door, seized the keys to the chest in which he kept public money as the collector of the king's taxes, and beaten up his wife, who was expecting at that time. That case was not proven, although we will suspect that maybe anyone with a covenant in sympathies didn't get the benefit of the doubt on that one. So possibly it was very much a two sides to a story. Gilbert fought at the Battle of Bothwell Bridge in 1679 and was first arrested for non-attendance at his parish church in Carsfern in 1682. He was taken to Dumfries and released on bail of £400 Scots provided by his father-in-law, James Dunn of Ben Watt, and returned to Waterhead. He did not turn up for his trial and so the money was forfeited. Soon after he was apprehended and was taken to Glasgow where on refusing to take the test where he was asked to affirm that the king was the head of the church, he was banished to the plantations in America. When sailing to the Carolinas in 1684, his father gave him 20 pounds, and with this sum he succeeded after his arrival in purchasing his freedom and returning home early the next year. Not long afterwards, he attended a prayer meeting in a cottage in Kirkmichael in South Ayrshire in June 1685. Meetings such as this, along with those held in the open air, were illegal and the cottage was surrounded by a party of armed soldiers led by Sir Archibald Kennedy of Killeen and John Reed of Balachmile. While trying to escape out a window, Gilbert McAdam was shot and killed. He was buried in Kirkmichael churchyard where a stone reads, Here lies Gilbert McAdam who was shot in this parish by the Laird of Killeen and Balloch Mile for his adherence to the Word of God and Scotland's covenanted work of Re Reformation, 1685. There was also an inscription commemorating the event put up over the entrance to the Macadam burial place in Carsfayne Church Churchyard, which you can, I can show any, any of you in a moment if you'd like, though now some of it a wee bit hard to read. Despite the Kirk Michael stone. Some believe that the body of Gilbert McAdam is interred in Carsfair. His son James was also a zealous covenanter, narrowly escaped apparently being shot when his uncle Roger Dunn was killed. So with the stories of these two individuals we get a snapshot of the troubled times the people of Carsfair Parish endured during the military occupation seeking to suppress <coughs> We sing now our next which is number 84 How lovely is thy dwelling place O Lord of hosts to me That is that is it Oh, love is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts to me. The tabernacles of thy grace, how pleasant, Lord, they be. My thirsty soul Oh, oh. 
Of taking up an offering in, in, a, in a rug at this point in our service. I'm not sure whether the Covenanters ever actually did the similar at their outdoor conventicles. So we'll cast it into the middle and see how we get on. <laughs> Don't feel obliged, this is a wee, wee tradition we have. Well, come with nothing, no worries. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. Let us pray. Lord, we dedicate these offerings to your glory and we thank you for the many blessings that come into our lives day by day. For us, life is so much easier than what the covenant has had to endure during the times of persecution over 300 years ago in these places, in these parishes amongst the hills. We thank you for your faithfulness which goes before us, that you are our strength and our shield, that we can find hope in you, leading even to eternity. May we still our hearts in your presence and know your love shed abroad in our lives, and may you strengthen us to be your faithful witnesses in our own time, to your love and to your mercy, to your salvation. Build your church, Lord, in these parishes. Enable it to go forward and to bring hope and new life and new beginnings to people in darkness and despair, struggling with these times that we live in. Lord, you are an ever-present help in our times of need. We, we find indeed in you our help, each step of our way. In Jesus' name we pray. And so we come to our Closing in the phrase, a paraphrase, O God of Bethel, by whose hands my people still are. Shall we stand to sing our finals?
of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. Can I just say a few words? I've been to every covenant that David's ever done and thoroughly enjoyed every one. And the effort that David puts into it makes me admire, admire him so much. We should miss him when he's gone, but we should always think of these covenants all over this parish. So I thank you, David, for all your hard work you've done. Thank I you. really appreciate it over the years. Thank you. Yeah, well well done. Yeah. 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 I mean, the tiles were placed just now. I was hoping that maybe it would have been finished the work by now, but not quite. But that church, maybe not, it's changed a lot since 1635, uh, 36, but it still has the same footprint of the church, although it's had many different uh, transformations over the years. We still have the, the communion cups that, that John Semple acquired in 1647, the year after he was ordained to the church here, which we still we think of all the history that has gone through those cups that were used right through the covenant times. You're welcome, well, if anyone needs a toilet, they're the, 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 the welcome to pop in and have a look around the church as well. And I'm happy to take people around to the Gilbert McAdams uh, resting place also. Thank well, you. Uh, I'd like to say something today because this man to me has been my life and covenanted and you can see the two of us here all the time. But I have a tune I've got to play for you, which I learned about 40 odd years ago. And it means to what this man means to me and our family. I wish you joy and this is the tune I've got to play for you. And I play it on this wee machine that I learned when I was nine year old. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so, you, George. I wish you joy on this, your last day. <laughs> Not quite my last day. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen that had the picture house in Dalpiti, if anyone knows uh, Mr. Sinclair, that was the picture house in Dalpiti. He taught me to play that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go down to the McAdam Mausoleum for anyone who wishes to come. 
Come and stop me. Stand with 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 me. Stand